Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started to honor the time. Um, yesterday, we had a bonfire fellowship at a North Shore, um, Camp Homelani, and it was a really good time, and thank you for those who have helped. Uh, it was really good. Uh, I really felt the God leading us. And next Saturday, there's this ministry called Hawaiian Islands Ministry, and First Presbyterian Church is leading, and uh, it's a, one of the largest ministries on the island where uh, many churches join together for a big conference called Hymn Conference. And one of my friends are their communication director, and they recommended a men mental health conference that's going to be held on Saturday from 9 to 4. And it's going to be in Kaneo in a church play called Anchor Church, and it's going to talk about aging. And I asked, um, oh, is there a specific target age group? And I said, young and old doesn't matter. It applies to us all. So uh, there's a mental health conference. If you are interested going, uh, then let me know. And um, English Ministry Council will be having a retreat uh, on the Labor Day weekend. So if you are in the council, please keep in mind. And uh, if you are interested in dropping by, let me know. Um, I will be uh, in California from Tuesday to Thursday this week, so there will be no Tuesday evangelism this week, but uh, at the end of the month, there's an event that, where you can participate in helping out Pastor Randy, some of you know, and please let me know, then I will um, uh, connect and give you the information for it. And... Um, Currently, I'm going through a coaching certificate program, so I'm coaching. Uh, coaching is a form of counseling that's very unique, and um, I've gone through some training, and I've been doing it uh, to fill my 70-hour requirement, and I have been doing it with some people. It's confidential, I can't tell you, but almost everyone, 100%, uh, really likes it, so I'm really curious of um, if you would like it to. If you're interested in going through a 30-minute session of coaching, through Zoom, uh, let me know, and um, uh, I'll share with you how it goes. Uh, we welcome you, and let us begin our worship. As we begin our worship, let us all stand and recite call to worship. In the fire and the flames, spirit appears to bless and inspire us. In the division and the despair, Christ arrives to challenge and invite us. In the shadows and the sorrows, God walks alongside to lift us up. In this moment, we gather together to worship, to pray, and to sing, and to lament. We gather on the blessed journey of life, death, and resurrection. Amen. Let us sing opening hymn, Lord Prepare Me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare us. Lord, prepare us to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and Thanksgiving will be, will be a living sanctuary for you. Let us be seated. Let us pray. Pray. 
gracious and loving God, enter our hearts, O Lord. Enter our worship with your promised presence that we may know you better. Enter our lives and our world that we may proclaim your presence and sing your praises. With joyous gratitude, we pray in your blessed name. Amen. Let us have a moment of silent prayer. Listen to God's voice or the Holy Spirit's comfort. God's face looks upon us with mercy and love. Christ's light shines through us as the image of God we were created to be. Amen. I'm going to sing with our friend, uh, Andrew. Uh, Mr. Andrew is uh, here to help us today. And as we sing shalom to you, for you, uh, I encourage you to go around and uh, say greetings or uh, have a a bottle of water as well, if you need, and we will sing shalom to you. Shalom to you now, shalom, my friend. May God's full mercies bless you, my friend. In all your living and through your life, Christ be your shalom, Christ be your shalom. Okay, this is a time of sharing of joys and concerns. If you have any news or prayer requests, uh, please stand and just share with us. I will not pass the mic for the safety precautions. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I took a picture of them doing body worship. It's like uh, it's, uh, it's uh, using your body for the Holy Spirit to work, and it was uh, really good to see. And um, you, you're very young to belong to that group, yeah? No, no problem. There's, and uh, it's in the heart, you know? So uh, it was good. Uh, I think we should invite Mike Lee, who is a kind of semi-professional dancer, and then have him lead us into those kind of yoga moves. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and yesterday, the, the place was so beautiful, you know, and uh, it was really good. Uh, I wish that our group can go there too, so, you know? Uh, it was really good. Uh, so, um, And the people were all very happy. Um, a lot of people say the same thing, you know, I wasn't sure if I want to come, it's too far away, you know, I'm stressed at work, but I'm glad, you know. Now, and so that was really awesome, yeah. Even my little nine-year-old Noah said he had a lot of fun. Uh, he needs us more, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, any prayer request? I just want to uh, welcome Michelle, uh, our friend. Yeah, Michelle is here. Oh, this is for, I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah. And um, uh, I, let me just introduce a good friend who have, God has led us. Uh, he Googled church near me and came here, uh, Tim Johnson. Yeah. Uh, so say, good, say hi to him. Yeah, welcome to the morning service. He come, came to the afternoon service before. Um, I want to continue to pray for Irene. Uh, yesterday, we had a scholarship for uh, her brother and um, he shared how he's gonna, he wants to study medicine to address the type 1 diabetes. And uh, I hope that you also address type 2 diabetes too. <laughs> uh, but um, if in this crisis, but God is going to guide her, uh, let's pray. Let's really pray for her as well. And Glenn Stanford uh, as well. Uh, any other prayers? And just a blessed time for this worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for guiding us through ups and downs. And thank you for your healing power for Karen, who has been relentlessly serving the people, the English congregations, Lord, day and night. And we thank you for Jimmy, who's leading the college and young adults group. And thank you for uh, just being with us yesterday. Although we are lacking in many things, you made it perfect. Lord, Heavenly Father, we lift up prayer for Irene. In the name of Jesus, may the healing powers penetrate into every cell of her body that she may become stronger and better. As we completely trust in you, Lord, watch over their family and also for Glenn and Glenn's family. And we lift up prayer for all those who are uh, here today that this worship may be a worship experience that really connects with you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing a new hymn. Uh, as you can see, we've been worshiping for about um, a little over a month, and I've been trying to introduce some classic songs, hymns for you to like. And um, I'm open to other suggestions as well. Uh, today, we will sing this hymn called Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Enjoy. Softly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals is waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling all sinners, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, 
calling all sinners, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love He has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, He has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling all sinners, come home. Now, our, the leaders of our boys group, uh, Deacon David Howard, will come and recite the scriptures for us. Today's scriptures are from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owned him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one that had a bigger debt forgiven. You judge correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Could, you, could we pray for me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we deliver the message, may the Holy Spirit guide me so that uh, it would help everyone here to have strength and to have wisdom and to have knowledge that you give. Lord, have mercy on me and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today's scripture, um, the title is, Do You See This Woman, it's from the scriptures. Today's message is about the love, God's love, and human response. Um, it's about reciprocal love relationship that we have with Jesus. And we have to be reciprocal. Many people heard and even experienced some, maybe directly, some God's forgiveness. But not many people uh, respond to God's grace with love. So today's scripture juxtaposes, contrast two individuals. One is a self-righteous Pharisee, and the other is so-called a woman who lived sinfully. Now, before the service, uh, some, some of you were asking, who's this person in our bulletin? And somebody said Mary Magdalene, and somebody said it's not. And you might, 
I will explain this. Now, in the Gospel of John, there, there's a Mary of Bethany, who's a sister of Martha, and brother of, uh, sister of Lazarus as well, who anoints Jesus' feet as Jesus, before Jesus enters Jerusalem to be crucified. Right? But that's from Gospel of John. But this is a different story in the Gospel of Luke. Completely different timeline. Let me just explain to you in the map. In the next picture, there's a map. As you can see, um, uh, in the very bottom, there's Jerusalem, Emmaus, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Bethany in the very bottom. Can you see? And if you go up, there's a place called Samaria. And above Samaria, in the yellow part, Mount Tabor, there's a place, Nazareth. And under Nazareth is Nain, the sea near that area. Uh, this story is from when Jesus was in Capernaum, near the Sea of Galilee, in the place called Nain. And Mary and Martha lived in Bethany. So it's very far away. But because it has the same name, Mary, some people thought, aha, Mary must be a prostitute, which is not, not, not we don't know. I won't say. So there are so many Marys. It's like I went to this retreat uh, with other churches, and there are four other pastors. Their name was Daniel. Everybody was Daniel. Yesterday at the retreat, we, we were like going over introducing names, and one of our... <laughs> One of our um, speakers, Christopher, said, wow, this is like very Korean-American names. Everybody has uh, Korean biblical names. And then there's another sister named Unhe. And then they got confused with other Unhe's. There are probably about 10 or 12 Unhe's in this island. So Mary is such a common name. Even Jesus' mother was Mary. And there's Mary Magdalene and Martha. So it's not that simple. But we know one thing. So we know one thing is that in this Gospel of Luke, it's a different story from Gospel of John. But they both have perfume. And here there's the word uh, in the next Bible verse, if you look at it. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, at the time... When you have dinner, you recline at the table and talk. And a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, he said, amartolos means sinfully. Now, Bethany is a village. It's called Kome in Greek. But here is Polis, city. In this city, there is this woman who lived sinfully. At the time, it's almost synonymous with a prostitute. There's no other uh, possibility. So we have here the most reputable, high-class elite of the society, the Pharisee, and a person whose status is probably the lowest at the time. Lowest. Tax collectors was the most despised. But in addition to that much level, prostitute was like the lowest in and it's frequently mentioned in the Bible as the worst of all people. And we have to understand, we have a very negative image of Pharisee because when we look up Pharisee, second definition is hypocrite. But that's because that's what it says in the Bible and we later turned out to be. But at that time, Pharisee meant the highest status educated people. But Jesus turned, radically turned this hierarchy upside down and then make us turn our attention inside out. And that's our goal today, to turn our view inside out, pointing in conclusion that this sinful woman is actually the true worshiper and the one who is eventually reconciled to God. So let's think about this today. If, you, if we could have that one thought today, this morning, would change uh, many, many years' worth of our life. So the goal of this story is to help us to see 
What's inside of us is more important than what appears on the outside. So if through today's sermon, if we could only see what Jesus was trying to tell us, that would change not only how we view ourselves, but it would change how uh, we view others differently. I once heard a preacher say, the reason that you view somebody in a way that you do is because you view yourself that way. That you have to change your own view of yourself first. So, this change from how the world sees uh, into how God sees you. Uh, one thing is that how the world treats you is not correct. It's important how God sees you. That will qualitatively change our life. According to the worldly perspective in ancient Israel, Pharisees were holiest people at all time who knew the law. And they did all things to observe God's law. It's like you're a driver and never got a ticket in your life. But Jesus criticized them because they were, in God's eyes, were hypocritical. So in appearance, Pharisees were good guys at the time, and the tax collectors and the prostitutes were the traitors and the sinners. However, Jesus sees the situation entirely differently. You know why? In today's verse, God sees the woman's tears and understands her heart in her context. In her context. While people look at the appearance and the outcome and the social status, God sees a person's tears. And uh, reformer Martin Luther said this is called this heart water. It's kind of it, I guess he spoke in German, heart water. Do we have a heart water? The question becomes, can we see what is behind people's tears? You know, yesterday we had a scholarship event in the morning, and I was, uh, I was uh, presiding. But because I know them, most many of them, I know their journey, their struggles, and their successes. And people don't know. And people just think, oh, they're smart or whatever. But I know. That's why I was so uh, immersed in happiness and filled with hope. That's how God sees us. God doesn't see us out of context. He sees us since we were toddlers of what we've been through and only he knows our situation while the world just compared from the outside God sees the whole context and is very pleased so a Christian should not see a person like the world does especially if we know that person's story and what situation the person has been through while the world just see the outcome so let me just share with you an uh, episode. There's a world-famous ballerina named Sujin Kang. Do you know Sujin Kang? Kang Sujin? Uh, my, my wife and I, we, did we, we went to see Kang Sujin, right? Once. I, they say it was going to be her last performance, and uh, it wasn't. But <laughs> so we bought the ticket and went. There's this world-famous ballerina named Sujin Kang, and she is a... Um, she was a principal dancer of Germany's famous Stuttgart Ballet. And later in Korea, was in charge of Korean Ballet. And everybody see this fantastic, successful scene. But if you look at the next picture, that's her feet, famous. So, and then if you hear her story, she's been through a lot. She practice like crazy and that's her feet but people don't see that uh, but in that feet you can see so much thing that she had to go through so let's see the next picture now this is uh, Michelangelo's sculpture La Pietas the piety 
And then when, when we, like, sometimes children say, I want to be an artist, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a sculptor someday. But what they don't know is once you become a sculptor, 99% is manual labor. And 1% is artistic genius. Because as you can see, the hands of the sculptor, they are not normal in that have to suffer and work really hard. So um, behind every artwork is a pain and suffering. And behind every suffering is somebody's love and determination, investment in that person. And to see what others cannot see, behind all of us is that spiritual source and what appears uh, to others doesn't appear to other people. Now let us look at what's behind today's story. We have, uh, as I told you, a Pharisee whose name is Simon, by the way. And Simon is also a very common name, Simon. Peter was Simon, right? But this Simon is a Pharisee and had a common name uh, so, and invited Jesus to have dinner. And Jesus was considered, he was itinerant prophet and miracle worker. So at the time, because they, they had people who would go from town and town and preach and then get food and then uh, do services for people. And he was considered like that, especially in Jewish context, he was a prophet. So this rich guy, Pharisee, the high class Simon, invites Jesus not for private conversation. It's, he had a courtyard and in his village, people could come and see this famous guy. And then when Jesus was there, this Pharisee Simon wanted to examine Jesus and try to see if he really was a prophet. As people say that he was. And we can find this out later in the scripture. But then all of a sudden this woman cries so much right before Jesus that she sheds her tears and her Jesus' feet get wet because of her tears. So that's the difference between this story and Mary's story in which Mary Magdalene um, intentionally um, puts oil. So, and then she had an alabaster jar with perfume oil. At the time, nowadays perfume is alcohol based. At the time, it's oil. It's a fragrance oil. And why, if you think about it, because she was the prostitute of the city, prostitute of the city, she carried with her oil for her work. So the Bible does not say she intentionally thought this beforehand. Okay, Jesus is coming. I'm going to go and I'm going to clean her, his feet with my tears. No, because nobody can really cry intentionally for long. So in verse 38, it says, As she stood behind him at his feet weeping. Why did she weep? Because she had so much going on inside her. Nobody understood her. Nobody knew her pain. And she, be she began to wet his feet for over a period of time because she began to wet his feet with tears. She cried out so much. And then she had to wipe it. And what she had long hair, then she used her hair to wipe it because she didn't have anything else to wipe it. And then, because she was sorry, she kissed him and then used her perfume uh, to finish it up. So that was actually the situation that we have. This unknown, unnamed, anonymous woman that we don't have name for had her own story of pain and suffering, so she broke down. She suffered her share of shame and humiliation trying to make a living. Perhaps she was trying to support her family in a very shameful way. And people made fun of her, treated like an object. And she probably didn't mean to cry, but her tears dropped on Jesus' feet. So she wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. So in verse 39, when the Pharisees who invited him saw this, he said to himself, it says, 
in the Bible, he said to himself, he didn't speak loud. He said to himself, if this man were really a prophet, he should have known that this woman, what kind of woman this is. The prostitute of the city, the famous, but she, he doesn't even know that. That's what he thought in his mind. So, we have to pay attention to this quote, what kind of woman? Here, we can see how Pharisee thinks. Pharisee tend to classify people and say, oh, this is the kind of woman that we should not relate to, and this is an evil person, scum of the earth. That's what he was thinking, probably. And she cannot change. Pharisees are usually really smart, but they classify people and judge them. But God, Jesus doesn't do that. But he was shocked because Jesus was touching her. So have you ever run into a person who, or we do that too, we, we sometimes say, oh, that's a good person and that's a bad person. When somebody tells me, oh, Pastor Danny, you're a good person, I get really nervous. You know why? Not because I'm a bad person. Because I am put in a scale in which I could be moved around. I get nervous. Because when you call somebody evil, you have a other agenda, like when, I don't want to create controversy, but when, when George W. Bush began to call North Korea axis of evil, then that's going to be controversial, yeah? I, you know, we all agree, yeah? But there's another reason for that, doing that. It's going to change the policy, right? So when we call somebody bad person by nature, Deprive that person of hope of changing. And maybe they did something wrong to you that made you feel like he's a bad person. But you have no hope for that person anymore. So that's what the word between, what kind of woman is that here, Pharisee is in the habit of, oh, this is a this kind of person, this is a this kind of person. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Jesus made it really clear. I came for her. I died for her. So the judgmental attitude, which I am also, also very guilty of, but I never think somebody's bad. I never do. So condemning that this woman is the kind of person who's so sinful that she will have no hope is very not Christ-like. In fact, this is how this Pharisaic society stigmatizes and perpetuates the hierarchy and they keep their class structure with a bias so that they could always be treated like that. Even when Jesus came to free the captives and bless the poor and heal the sick and comfort and oppress people of the land. So Jesus turned to Simon and reading his mind says, Jesus says, Simon, I have something to tell you. And this is a very important word. Jesus said this to like uh, disciples too. Come here, I have something to tell you. Look at this uh, woman with two copper coins. She actually is doing more offering than those hypocrites. So, and then this Simon said, tell me, teacher, the teacher is... Just rabbi. He just tell me, sir, at the time. And but Simon is really surprised because Jesus read his mind. He was mumbling to himself. And then Jesus says this story. He says, two people owed money. And then one owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. Now, one dinar is a day's age, wage. So 50 dinar is for example, we we'll say it's ten thousand dollars. Five hundred denarii is hundred thousand dollars. So there's a guy who rented hundred thousand dollars, and there's a guy who rented only ten, um, lended only ten dollars. But neither of them have the money to pay. 
Now, this is for all, us all. We all don't have, we can't pay God for who, our sins. And then, he forgave our debt. Now, the word ekarisato, karis means grace. Ekaristopoli means thank you very much, grace. It's a free gift. So God gave us free gift and for, let go of all of our sins and our debts. Now, which one of them will agape say? Means love, agapa, agape. Which of them would love me more? Now, the one who I forgave, I let go of $50 and the one who I forgave, $100,000. Do you see the difference? They would be more appreciative, $100,000. That's a question. And this implies we're all sinners, large or small. And Simon uh, replied. He was correct. He said, I suppose, in verse 43, the one who had a bigger debt. Uh, anybody can uh, figure that out. And then Jesus said, you're correct. And that's what Socrates used to say. You're correct. And then he turned toward the woman, Jesus, and said to Simon, this is today's sermon. Do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? That's today, maybe God is, do you see a person when you see somebody? Do you judge them? good or bad, and classify how much good or bad? Or do you see that person, precious, unique creation of God? If that person is still far away from God because of sin, they're going to be more filled with grace and thankful to God. But we don't do that. We classify them and avoid people we don't like. And that is very anti-Christ. So, and Jesus said, I came into your house, Simon. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears. She was desperate, wiped them with her hair. So, and the next verse. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, had not kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but this woman had put oil on my feet. The perfume is oil, fragrant oil. So what Jesus is doing, how Jesus is seeing people, is that seeing the heart and the potential and Repentant, contrite heart. See, town people, they judge her for her past sin on the outside and her social status as a prostitute. But can, can you, can we, Jesus, can you not see her the way that I see her? The one who received forgiveness of sins and is a beneficiary of greater God's grace. And then Jesus continues to say to Simon, all these things. And then in verse 47, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Now, her, she has many sins. I'm not saying that prostitution is a serious sin. But her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. She, but she loves me more. She loves me more. And then Jesus said to her, your sin have been forgiven. Now, what did this woman do? She did not say a single word. All she did is cry. Wipe Jesus' feet with what she had. But she, Jesus already knew what she was going through. And God knows what you are going through today. You don't have to explain to anybody. And he's on your side. What's amazing is that as long as you have God who's on your side, you become free from what other people tell you. 
So this is a true moment of what it means to worship. Because during your worship, we bring our tears and sorrows and regrets and the pain and which the world may never know about ourselves. And God embraces the contrite and broken heart that we have with his compassion and mercy. And then God declares to you too today. In verse 48, it says, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And we respond with our great love because we have been forgiven all of all of our stress and all of the complications and confusions that we might have. When Jesus sends the one away, he says, your faith has saved you. In other words, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. This means that now you have a personal relationship with me. And your personal relationship with me is going to continue to restore you. So the two most important words that shows God's action and our response is two. To summarize, grace and agape. We love God because God unconditionally gave you grace. And please... Don't forget, let no one block you from the fact that God loves you unconditionally. No, no person has a right to judge you, classify you, condemn you, nor do you have that right. When God says, it's okay, I know your story that no one knows in your soul. And I forgive you. So God embraces us. God assures of us our peace and well-being. We love God because of that. This is the foundation of our relationship to God. And this is why I can stand here. I can stand here. Why? Because Jesus is with his own death to the cross. He said, Donnie, I'll change you. You'll stand with your grace in faith. So unlike the world or Pharisees who may judge or play blame games or put shame or guilt trip or try to control you, God, whom we believe, declares freedom from sin and guilt. Freedom to be emotionally and mentally and spiritually and even physically well. This is what it means to have true peace, shalom. Shalom actually means wholesome wellness of our entire being. So Jesus draws our attention to this woman and helps us to see her tears and her anointing of Jesus' feet and her love for Jesus. And her experiencing of God's affirming forgiveness of her sins. So if you are able to see this woman and become like her heart today, God will speak to your heart. Same word. Donnie, your sins are forgiven. 너의 죄를 사노라. That's Korean. So uh, let me just throw you with questions and end our today's sermon. Theological reflection from today's scripture. First, do not judge other people and divide them, classify them as good or bad. Let's not do that. Second, ask ourselves, did we have the courage to open our heart to God transparently and with all our vulnerability because sometimes we don't want to open ourselves up because even if it's God you know um, we don't want to but with God in your prayer you should because you should trust God because he will never he will never condemn you he will never do that he will just show you the way if you look at the next slide Hmm? 
is there another slide there, the title? Yeah. So you look at this woman. What are you thinking? And God is asking, if you look at this person, do you see this woman, the soul? Or are you busy trying to uh, label her? And that is the question. The next slide, last one. Have you experienced God's forgiving grace? So this is the very reason that we're here to worship, and this is the very reason gospel is here, to help you experience forgiving grace. And if you can do that every Sunday, and God will guide you, and you will be blessed, and we will be blessed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we th give, thank you for giving us space this time. And whether, um, whatever the reasons, Lord, uh, may we be reminded of the nature of God, his goodness and mercy, that they may heal us and strengthen us and help us to experience the forgiving grace every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing carol chorus uh, while gathering the offering, if you would like. Uh, care course. I cast all my cares. I cast all my cares. I lay all of my burdens. Remembers me. And then I will close with benediction. Jesus, remember me. Kingdom, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you our hearts and offering our time and our friendship. Please accept our lives and transform us to be vibrant, active, and blessed as you meant us to be. Now the grace of Jesus Christ and everlasting love of the Father God and the fellowship and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit fill our hearts and our lives as we go out to the world and become the salt and light of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.